After he had fed the people, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and proceed him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, he came towards them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught Peter and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? After that, he got in the boat and the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Hello and welcome to Closer Walk. I'm Father Bai, your host, and we're glad that you can join us today. Peter, Lord, if it's really you, then tell me to walk, come to you on the water. You come here. You have a thought that our Lord would say to himself, what was I thinking asking this group to be my disciples? I mean, everything I do, everything I say, I don't believe it. They struggle with it. They think I'm a ghost. Who else do they know who walks on water? The disciples. The imperfect. Thomas, the one who doubted. Peter, the one who denied, all of the ones who were confused, all of the ones who didn't recognize him, all of the ones who didn't understand what he was talking about. An interesting realization about discipleship. More often than not, people think discipleship means you bring with it certain credentials, you bring with it certain credibility. And the understanding is, as you look at the life of the disciples, now, think for yourself. If you had the opportunity for three years to live with the Lord and to watch him, watch everything that he did, you know, you know the lame walk, the blind see, the dead are raised to life, you see all this stuff and you're still going, uh, I don't really get it here. What are you talking about? realization for you, the realization for me, the hope that this gospel gives is despite our imperfections, despite our doubts at times, despite our difficulties in understanding where God is in the middle of this, God calls us to fidelity. God calls us to trust. When I was doing the work of vocations, one of the great lines in vocation work is, is God doesn't always call the qualified. God qualifies everything that he calls. Bearing in mind that the most important thing about discipleship is a pure heart. A willingness to serve God and look for ways to serve God in our lives. We're very good at finding excuses about discipleship. We're very good at saying, you know, I'm, I'm just not, I'm, I'm just not talented enough. I'm just not smart enough. I don't have enough background. I don't have enough training. I don't think I can do this well enough to serve God. The understanding is, is that in the service of God, anything that we have to offer is good enough. And if we do it out of love for God, it's good enough. More often times, what happens is 
is we say we're doing it for the love of God. And in the human context, in the parish context, in the diocesan context, we give it our very best. Someone criticizes us and we say, the heck with all of you. If that's not good enough, I'm not doing anything. So many times people are put off because they don't think they're qualified enough. People don't even come forward because they don't think they're qualified enough. The challenge for all of us is to look at the life of the disciples and realize <laughs> they weren't that bright. And at times they weren't that faithful. Not in the sense that they had another life altogether and they were working against the Lord, but it's like, you know, what part of this don't you get? You, you're not following me here. And yet they remained with the Lord. They remained faithful. And that's the greatest call that we need for discipleship in parish life. And when we look at the church, and we look at our church parish, and trust me, you know, with 1,400 families, I know at least 1,350 of them who think they can run a parish much better than anybody else. And they know how to fix this, and they know how to fix that, and they know how to fix the other thing. That's very common these days, that people think that they know how to do things so much better. But the question I ask, and I think the question every one of you has to ask, what am I doing to take up the call to discipleship and to serve God in my parish context? What do you do? Actually, what do you do in the parish? Besides, if going to Mass regularly, which is important, and more people need to realize that it is a church law, that we're bound by church law to go to, uh, to, go to Mass every week. Once a year, we're bound by church law to go to confession and receive communion once between Ash Wednesday and Pentecost Sunday, what we used to identify as Easter duty. That's the bare minimum. Mass every week, mass uh, confession and communion at least once a year between Ash Wednesday and Pentecost Sunday. But what are you doing in your parish? What do you add to it? What do you bring to the table? And a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I give money and I give good money. That's fine. Thank you. Obviously, you know that we can't run a parish on our looks. Thank God, we'd be dead broke. But anyway, we have to depend upon the support of our people, but not just monetary support. When we talk about stewardship, we talk about time, we talk about talent, and we talk about treasure. I don't have any talents that I can use in the church. I don't have the background. I don't have the knowledge. Do you realize how busy I am by the time I get to work, get back into the carpool and kids and this and that and the other? My grandmother was, was funny. She was widowed at 33 and raised five children and became a widow with the baby being six and her oldest being 15. And my, my, my grandmother worked two jobs and went to Mass and Communion every day of the world. At the age of 85, she was still a Eucharistic minister at the local college campus. And the thing is, is that back in the day of the leaflets, the little uh, apostleship of prayer leaflets, my grandmother was the one who on Saturdays, her and her kids went throughout the neighborhood and you went and you delivered these little leaflets. They were called the apostleship of prayer. This was long before we had the resources that we had today. And people used them as daily prayer. And her old Irish pastor, you know, asked her to be the apostleship of prayer lady. And, and, she, and my grandmother said, oh, my senior, she said, you know, with the five kids and the two jobs and everything. And she said, the, the Monsignor said, I always ask busy people to do stuff. The ones who are not busy are not busy for a reason. They don't care. They don't get involved. They only find time for things that they want to do for themselves, but they very rarely find time to do things for others or do things for the church. 
And the reality is, is the old argument that, you know, I'm just not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not well trained, I don't have this, I don't have that. Well, you know what? In your parish school of religion, maybe you don't think you have the theological background. Most parishes offer training. And if you don't have the theological background, do you realize how difficult it is for these teachers to have 15, 16 kids and get everything going and everything motivated and the kids settled and get the work done? You got time to go there and help them? You got time to try and help with the parish nursery on Sunday? You got time once a month to meet with the Ladies' Altar Society or the Men's Club or the Knights of Columbus or the Liturgy Committee or any of the other various groups that serve the needs of other people? The sad thing is, today, I find the people who complain the most are the ones who do the least. They're the ones who do the least. The ones who are out there trying, they can give criticism because they're involved and they know what's going on and what's not going on, but they realize the challenge. And they realize the other people involved, whether it be the church choir, whether it be the ushers, whether it be the lady, whatever group it is, they realize the rest of the people are just like them. They're imperfect, but they're willing. And they give them the benefit of the doubt, and they recognize their efforts, as imperfect as there might be, because they go through the exact thing themselves. The challenge of discipleship and it's well documented throughout all of sacred scripture. The challenge of discipleship is not background, is not certification, it's not training. It's a willingness. It's a willingness to put ourselves out there and do it for the glory of God. And you know what? If someone thinks you're terrible and, and you're singing, so what? You're not singing for them. You're singing for the glory of God. You know what? If someone thinks you're just not really good at it, you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for the glory of God. But first of all, we have to develop the heart that says, you know what? I need to give back. God has been so good. God has been so generous. I need to give back. Speaking with a man who's got very serious issues right now, and 25 years ago, we went through cancer together. And in the course of talking to him now and just wondering why God's putting him through that, I asked a question. I said, you know, you should have been dead 25 years ago. Do you think you've showed God your appreciation for the last 25 years? He said, probably not. And I said, well, you're over 80 years old. When are you going to start? When are you going to let him know? The reason why we don't give back oftentimes, aside from thinking we're not qualified, is we're just not grateful. Look at what is, not what's missing. Look at what is and ask yourself the question, have I done anything to give back to God for all the blessings and gifts he's given to me? If not, what are you waiting for? We'll be right back. Stay with us. Thank you for joining us here at Closer Walk. Now more than ever, we're truly convinced that there's a great need for the gospel message to be proclaimed boldly and proudly with great clarity and great charity. The things that we see going on in our society, unfortunately sometimes even from our government and our leadership, really don't reinforce the gospel values and at best make us suspect for upholding the gospel values. And oftentimes, you're not gonna have people who have the, the courage and the grace and the witness to stand up and proclaim very boldly the gospel. And so we need you. We need you here. We need your prayerful for support first and foremost. And secondly, we really do need your financial support. Our whole operation is donor-driven. We thank you for all the prayer that you give us 
and we pray that your support will continue to make this show possible. God bless you. As Jesus was walking towards him on the sea, he said, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it is really you, then tell me to come to you on the water. And the Lord said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water towards the Lord. But when he saw how strong the winds were, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Welcome back. I'm Father Bai. We're glad that you can join us. And he got out of the boat. He began walking on the water. But then he started to look at the storm and not the Lord. And he began to sink. The storms of life. There are a lot of them out there. There really are a lot of them out there. Do you realize how fear-based our lives have become? If you don't, you haven't flown in the last 10 years. You all but got to get undressed and got to go through your luggage and you can't have three, more than four ounces of anything and everything like that. And we're afraid. You're afraid that someone's going to blow us out of the sky just getting on an airplane. What happened to the good old days when they were just looking for drugs, huh? Anyway, the fear. Do you realize how often you get warnings on the news about what they're, what they're now calling the bumper rapes. You know, someone bumps into you, you get out of the car, the person is assaulted, molested, raped, whatever. You realize how much fear we live in when we go into our homes and we need to make sure that all the alarms are on and everything is properly set and we've got the deadbolts on and everything like that. Years ago, I read a very, I thought it was a very funny story about a person who, uh, she was a New York Times reporter, and they had discovered this tribe somewhere in the Amazon jungle, somewhere in, and I don't remember what, where it was, but this civilization did not know about it, and they discovered this tribe for the very first time. And this lady goes down, and she's going to write an article about these primitive people. And what she does is she goes down there, and you know she comes in peace, and they began to accept her, and somehow she was able to communicate, and this, that, and the other. And she had one morning where she got to spend it with the chief of this tribe, and she got to accompany him, him on a fishing trip. And they got there, and he was fishing, and they were, she was talking to him and everything like that. He caught whatever amount of fish he wanted. He took his fish, left his pole right there, and he walked back to the village. And she said, oh, you forgot your pole. And he said, that's okay, I, I leave it here. And she said, well, won't anyone take it? And she, he said, no. And he said, why not? She said, because it's not theirs. They won't take it. She said, oh, OK. She said, so I go back to New York. I clear security. I get out of the airport. My cab drops me off right at my building. She said, I had to put my key card to get inside the building. I had to pass by the doorman who recognized me. Then I had to punch in a code to get into the elevator. And I get to the elevator, and she said, I, I, I undo my, my bolt lock, my dead bolt. I undo my door lock. She said, I get inside. I put my chain lock on, my bolt lock on. I lock my door again. I turn off my alarm pad, and then I sit at my computer 
to write about these primitive people. We live in fear. We live in fear of the storms of life. And we live in fear that something's going to happen to our children. We live in fear that something's going to happen to our marriage. We live in fear of illness. We live in fear of people that, that we love getting in trouble. We live in fear of going out in public. You know, how many times do we hear, oh, there was this Martin, uh, Martin Luther King parade and someone, there was violence. So we hear about the 4th of July celebration and there was violence. We hear about the Christmas parade and there was violence. We hear about Mardi Gras and there was violence. And people are so scared because we don't know all these people and we're getting afraid of one another. And the storms of life, whatever they might be, are things that all of us live with on a daily basis. And the question is, is where do we find relief? Because if you allow yourself to watch the news every night and look at what's going on, not only in this country, although we don't have a whole lot to brag about, but throughout the world. And people like ISIS saying, we'll see you in New York and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we have terrorist threats and we're scared to you know, go into sports arenas now. We're scared to go into big crowds because they can become terrorists, target, all these different things. And how do you live? How do you live free when fear dominates everything that we do? And if you notice, in fear of drowning, Peter was able to do that which he was not ever, ever capable of doing as long as he kept his eyes on the Lord. It's when he took his eyes off the Lord that he began to sink. How does that translate in our lives? How does that translate? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so scared. I went to the doctor. They said they found a spot on my MRI, and they're going to let me know the results. Oh, my gosh. You know, I better start planning my funeral. It's, I've done it. I've done it before. Took a brain scan, found a spot. I had to come in a couple days later. From the time I drove from my parents' home to the rectory, of which I didn't tell them anything about the spot on my, my brain scan, I had planned my funeral. I had the preacher, I had the music, I had, the, I had everything done. We make these assumptions. How do we live through that uncertainty? If not, but for keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord. How do we deal with the fact that our child has gone through addiction and we're so scared that they're using again and they're living in a situation and we're scared for this, we're scared for that, if not for keeping our eyes on the Lord? How do we deal with the struggles of marriage today and modern marriage and all the challenges that that brings and so afraid that one of the other is going to come home and say, you know, honey, this just didn't work and we can't do this anymore. If not for keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord, how do we deal with that young teenager who's taken on a very promiscuous lifestyle and we've talked to him until we're blue in the face and nothing happens and we're so scared of the consequences, uh, be it pregnancy, be it abortion, be it disease, be it whatever decisions they make. They're making decisions with their life that they're not ready to make. If not for keeping our eyes on the Lord. That's really, that's really the, the point of that story. As long as Peter was looking at the Lord, he was walking on water. In the middle of a storm, Peter was walking on water. But then he started to look at the storm and not at the Lord. And when you look at the storm and not the Lord, that's when he started to sink. That's when he went under. And I offer you that. You know, whenever we find situations, the storms of life, you name it, they're all out there. How do you get on a plane and fly to some area of the world and, you know, you've had to all but get undressed at the gate and, you know, pray, well, is our plane going to go down? I don't know. I have no idea. I'll tell you this much. I go to confession every time I make an international flight. You know, and then I go. And if God's got other plans, God's got other plans. It's going to happen one way or the other. It's that ability 
to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord and know that in the storms of life, we're not alone. One of the things that so many people do is they, the storm's coming, you know, and I live in a hurricane area, so, you know, we have hurricane preparedness, and you got to get your batteries, and you got to get your extra water, and you got to get gasoline for your uh, generator, and you got to do, we do all the hurricane preparedness. And guess what? I don't care how much we prepare, we can't stop a storm or start a storm to come towards us or to avoid us. What's going to happen is going to happen. But whether or not I have my eyes fixed on the Lord depends upon whether or not I can take it in faith and find peace within my life and give it to God or whether or not I'm going to be well crazy before the storm gets here. I'm going to be well crazy before whatever is going to happen with the marriage, whatever's going to happen with the children, whatever's going to happen with terrorism, whatever's going to happen with the government, whatever's going to happen with whatever. I'm just making myself crazy. I can't live like this. I have a hard time sleeping at night because I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that and I'm worried about the other thing. It's not being fixed on the Lord. It's not being fixed on the Lord. How many times do we think that adoration would be a great way for me to deal with the storms? You name it. We've all got them. There's that unknown in all of our lives that we live with that if we allow ourselves to dwell on it, it deprives us of sleep, deprives us of sanity, deprives us of a whole lot of different things. But we keep our eyes fixed on the Lord, and guess what? We're all but walking on water. We've risen above it all. We're not stupid. We know it may or may not happen, but I know I'm not alone. I know the Lord is with me. And so many times we look for the right solution, the right counselor, the right medication, the right, you name it. And in the meantime, we bypass the Lord. We're looking at the storm. We're not looking at the Lord. And like Peter, we start to go under. Like Peter, the storm becomes stronger than we are, and we can't handle it. The message is, surely you are the Son of God. Even the wind and the seas obey you. The Lord is stronger than the storm. Keep your eyes fixed there. Make sure in the worst parts of the storm, you're looking at him more than ever. You'd be amazed at how much peace and how much comfort we have. We thank you for being with us today. May each day bring you closer in your walk with the Lord. God bless you.